You don't become what you want because so much of wanting is about living in the space of what you don't have. Lack of belief is the world's number one problem. The real spiritual practice is to like live from within and not let the world define who you are, but you do that for yourself. That's, that's the hardest work. Rise and shine, it's espresso time. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I am not a morning person, but when you start your day with a powerful routine that inspires you, like watching one of these videos, it can change your life. So let's start your day off right together. Grab your coffee, know that I believe in you, and get ready for a shot of espresso from Oprah Winfrey. I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. Many of you, as I have been, as I am, are where you are in your life based upon what you believe. And it's not just what you think you believe on the surface, it's also your shadow beliefs that are holding you back from moving into the life that you believe you deserve. What I know is if you're not looking at the shadows, if you're not looking at what is subconsciously running through the tape in your mind, telling yourself you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, you're not smart enough, you're not enough, which is a tape that's playing for a lot of people. If you're not conscious of that, then you end up acting out of that belief system and not out of what you know to be the truest or want to be the truest for yourself. But you don't become what you want because so much of wanting is about living in the space of what you don't have. That's why Jim Carrey's story is so powerful because he started to act as though he already had it. He would go up to Mulholland Drive, he would drive away saying, thinking, I already have those things, I just haven't accessed them as yet. I believe those things are going to come to me and I'm going to act like they are, so I'm gonna move forward in my life in order to draw that to myself in such a way that my actions are in alignment with what I say I believe. So if you start to think about that, really, why are you where you are in your life? The choices that you have made have been because of what you believe to be true for yourself. Lack of belief is the world's number one problem. I put it in my bios and on my social media accounts. I put it in my official bio and people introduce me. Lack of belief is the world's number one problem. You have what I call Michael Jordan level genius. That's something, you, 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 hello, hi, you, you're a genius at something, you're genius. You, you are the best in the world at something. You are, and it's not what your parents did, and it's not what your friends did, and it's not what you went to school for, but you can be the greatest in the world at something. The problem is you don't believe that one, that that's possible, like nah. Some days you might, but not consistently. And two, you don't believe that you can get there. And so you don't. And we have these moments, these, these hits of inspiration, and then it falls back down. And what I'm trying to do is this fight that, both for, for myself, I don't fully believe in myself to hit the next level, and then, and then for you, for the world to spread. Because I think if everybody could live their Michael Jordan level genius, what an amazing world to be in. It doesn't mean everybody needs to be an entrepreneur, but everybody's got Michael Jordan level genius or something. And it, it wasn't possible in the past to actually live that life. You know, think about how old you are right now. Think about your parents. When your parents were your age, you know, what year was it? When your parents were your age, what year was it? The opportunities available to your parents when they were your age were drastically different. It wasn't possible for them. My parents, how old am I now? I'm 41. Uh, when I started my YouTube channel, I was 29. When my parents were 29 or 41, YouTube didn't exist. You had to be crazy to be an entrepreneur. It was just so much harder. Now it's, it's all possible and it's only getting easier. It's only getting easier to find more role models, to find more access. It's only getting easier. 
but it starts with you believing that it's possible. So, in today's video, I want to I want to share the three ways to get more belief. People ask me. I mean, belief is important. It's on my shirt. <laughs> believe. How do you get more belief? We're going to break it down today to help you do it because it's easy to say, "Well, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself." Well, okay, but how? Inspiration, courage, and consistency. Inspiration, courage, and consistency. So, inspiration is being around the things that inspire you to believe in yourself more. That could be these videos. You know, that could be other videos. That could be podcasts and books. That could be friends. That could be communities or groups like Movement Makers. What inspires you? And you've already you've already felt belief. When did you feel the most belief in yourself and what you're capable of? What were you doing? Who were you around? Where were you? What were you listening to or watching or reading? And then finding some kind of consistent source to have that in your life. You need to be regularly inspired to believe in yourself more, to believe in what could happen, believe in what could be, what you can create. What helps you believe in yourself more? When were those moments? So some people say that inspiration is not enough, and they're right. It's not. You know, motivation, motivation alone is not enough. You have to do something. What's the point of watching a video like this? It's not just to get hyped up and inspired. It's to do something. Why in every video? Why do I say what's your plan of action? Write down in the comments below. What's your plan of action? I wonder what are you going to do? Your life doesn't change until you do. But the point of watching a video like this, the point of getting inspired, the point of getting motivated. Leads you to the second point, which is courage. Inspiration needs to lead to courage. Inspiration alone is a life unfulfilled. Courage to then take the action. Watching a video like this, the hope is that it gets you inspired enough to believe in yourself, even if for a moment, guys, even if only for a moment. You don't need to have belief all day long. You just need a moment of belief to give you the courage. To do something, to commit to somebody, to make that video, to send that email, to make that phone call, to start—it's the courage to start. But without the inspiration, you won't have the courage because the idea is too big. You've got this big goal, big dream, big plan for yourself. You're going to feel like it's impossible, so you never start. You don't summon the courage because you weren't inspired. So, inspiration step number one, which leads to the the courage. To actually do something, which is important, why you don't leave that moment. Nina's here. Hey, Nina, we love you. <laughs> the courage to start something, right? Whenever you feel inspired and empowered, motivated, amazing, the best thing you can do is take immediate action. Immediate action on your goals. I believe that when you are feeling inspired, courageous, motivated, etc., whatever ideas come to you are actually the best ideas for you. Have you ever ever had? You ever gone to a conference? You ever watched a video? You got so inspired. That I'm gonna do this. I believe that that idea is the best thing for you. It's the best thing for you. And then you fall back down to normal. Your head takes over, keeps you scared, safe, protected, and you don't do it. And we just spike between these moments of inspiration. The best thing to do is to take some kind of immediate action. After watching a video that gets you hyped up, do something. After going to a conference that gets you hyped up, do something. After having a conversation with with a friend that gets you inspired, do something. Do something. Do something. Do something. Do something. The inspiration, the only value in the inspiration is yes,、uh, you know, an afternoon or an evening or a couple hours of feeling good. But it's the doing something, it's the the courage, that leads you to taking some kind of action to make your life change. You have to do something. Immediate action when you're feeling inspired. The third part. So inspiration leads to the courage to do something, to then consistency. Consistent action will lead you to your dream life, the goals you want, the impact you want to have. It'll be consistently doing these things. The difference between an achiever and a high achiever is the consistent. Willingness to do the thing when it's hard, the consistent willingness to show up when it's hard, because otherwise you just jump between starting and stopping, and starting and stopping, and starting and stopping. You get inspired. Most people get inspired a lot. Great, inspired, inspired, inspired. Some people will take irregular action, 
Every now and then you'll take some kind of action. And then the highest of the high achievers, they take consistent action. And so you need to put, make this a part of your daily routine where it's every day you watch a video like this. Every day you're part of a community like Mover Makers. Every day you're reading a book or podcast, something that's filling you up to make you feel inspired. The inspiration leads to that moment of courage where you're gonna say yes to yourself and say yes to that project and make that phone call or make that video, do some kind of action. Not just research or plan or watch another video, but do something. And then every single day, do that. Make it a consistent part of your daily routine. If you did that, your life in a year will look dramatically different. It just will, it, it just has to. Imagine if you woke up every day, not expecting to feel inspired, because you won't. I don't wake up feeling inspired every day, but you're gonna wake up, do the thing that creates inspiration for you, that then leads to some kind of courageous action, and then you're consistent doing that. Could you imagine if every day for the next year you did that? Every day for the next year you woke up, you got inspired, you took courageous action, and you did that consistently for a year, you won't recognize your life. It'll be dramatically different than where you are right now. Make the change. That's how you start to have more belief in yourself. Belief that it's possible, belief that you can, belief that it will work out. Because belief, says Nina, because you deserve it. Timo deserves it, he looks tired. Nina deserves it. The world deserves it. Your family deserves it. It's time to start showing up. Believe. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough, that's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here, the today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action of when and how you're gonna follow through, when you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through, and when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through, Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate you. Also, if you wanna have more self-confidence and self-belief, the science says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action for the habit to stick. That's what I want for you. So I've designed a custom free program where I'm gonna send you an unlisted video for the next 254 days to shift your confidence and belief forward. The link to join is in the description below. It was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything. The real work is to figure out where your power base is. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do, that your talent cannot be dismissed. What about something that you feel like you've personally achieved or overcome? Is there something that you are especially proud of yourself for? Yeah, I'm uh, especially proud of myself for not uh, living in the world of comparisons. You know, uh, years ago when I pulled out that wagon of fat, I was actually comparing myself to everybody else or what I thought you're supposed to look like or what size you're supposed to be. So I've now reached the point where I'm really okay exactly where I am and that's you know it's taken me a lifetime practically oh, to figure that out and being, being okay exactly where you are because comparing is a dangerous it's so thing. hard because we are in the world of insta comparison mm -hmm. you know and so the real spiritual practice is to like live from within and not let the world define who you are but you do that for yourself that's that's the hardest work I'm going to continue developing shows that speak uh, to the humanity of people in a way that makes them want to live better and do better and um, that ex exalts their, their, their victories and lets them know that they are important and meaningful right. in the world. You know, I would have to say that every day, David, that show was such a, it was like therapy for me, kind of like now. Right. Uh, right. Uh, every day the show was I paid attention. So I, I've never been to a therapist, but uh, I, I, I paid attention all those days on the show. And I made therapy acceptable for a lot of people who thought, oh, not me, not. So 
one of the things I started to get uh, around mid to late, no, no, late, mid to late 90s, is that everybody that I had on the show at the end of the show would say something to me like, um, was that okay? Was that okay? How was that? Was that okay? Right. At the end of the interview. And I started to then track it. It didn't matter if it was, um, I, 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 I had gone and done a show where I was in um, a prison and I was interviewing a father who was in jail for life for murdering his twin daughters. And at the end of the interview, even behind bars, he said to me, is that okay? How'd right. I do? And Barack Obama said it when he sat in the chair the first time. And George Bush said it. Beyonce said it at the end of her, she taught me how to twerk and then said, is that okay? Right, right, right. <laughs> so that's an acquired skill, do you think? Right? Yes, a twerking thing. But this is what I learned uh, sitting in that chair for 25 years. That at the end of the day, whether you are interviewing me or I get to interview you, whatever your profession is, wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, the person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that mattered? There's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it, to step into it. Your life is big. Your life is huge. And we spend so much time wanting to be in somebody else's life. And you don't get honored. You don't get revered. You don't get celebrating wanting what somebody else has. Because that which created you, divine intelligence that dreamed you from before your ancestors ever knew they would become your ancestors, that which dreamed the seed of you wants you to know how special, how wondrous, how mysterious, how complex, how glorious, how phenomenal you are. And you get no credit messing in somebody else's territory. Or trying to have power over something you have no control. Another one of my favorite teachings is the Wizard of Oz. When the witch, Wicked Witch of the West says, go away from here because you don't have any power here, you have no power in any territory other than your own. Oh, but you are the master of that. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. So the Angel Network, I've been on the air for a long time, but it was the Angel Network that actually focused my internal GPS. It helped me to decide that I wasn't just gonna be on TV every day, 
but that the goal of my shows, my interviews, my business, my philanthropy, all of it, whatever ventures I might pursue, would be to make clear that what unites us is ultimately far more redeeming and compelling than anything that separates me. Because what had become clear to me, and I want you to know, it isn't always clear in the beginning, because as I said, I'd been on television since I was 19 years old. But around 94, I got really clear. So don't expect the clarity to come all at once, to know your purpose right away. But what became clear to me was that I was here on earth to use television and not be used by it. To use television to illuminate the transcendent power of our better angels. So this angel network, it didn't just change the lives of those who were helped, but the lives of those who also did the helping. It reminded us that no matter who we are or what we look like or what we may believe, it is both possible and more importantly, it, it becomes powerful to come together in common purpose and common effort. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself as a human being. You want to max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up, your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The world needs people like Michael Stalzenberg from Fort Lauderdale. When Michael was just eight years old, Michael nearly died from a bacterial infection that cost him both of his hands and both of his feet. And in an instant, this vibrant little boy became a quadruple amputee, and his life was changed forever. But in losing who he once was, Michael discovered who he wanted to be. He refused to sit in that wheelchair all day and feel sorry for himself, so with prosthetics, he learned to walk and run and play again. He joined his middle school lacrosse team, and last month when he learned that so many victims of the Boston Marathon bombing would become new amputees, Michael decided to banish that darkness with light. Michael and his brother Harris created Mikey'sRun.com to raise $1 million for other amputees by the time Harris runs the 2014 Boston Marathon. More than a thousand miles away from here, these two young brothers are bringing people together to support this Boston community the way their community came together to support Michael. And when this 13-year-old man was asked about his fellow amputees, he said this, first, they will be sad. They're losing something they will never get back and that's scary. I was scared. But they'll be okay. They just don't know that yet. We might not always know it. We might not always see it or hear it on the news or even feel it in our daily lives, but I have faith that no matter what, class of 2013, you will be okay and you will make sure our country is okay. I have faith because of that nine-year-old girl who went out and collected the change. I have faith because of David and Francine Wheeler. I have faith because of Michael and Harris Stolzenberg. And I have faith because of you, the network of angels sitting here today. One of them, Khadija Williams, who came to Harvard four years ago. <laughs> Khadija had attended 12 schools in 12 years, living out of garbage bags, amongst pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers, homeless, going into department stores, Walmart in the morning to bathe herself so that she wouldn't smell in front of her classmates. 
And today she graduates as a member of the Harvard class of 2013. Heidi's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end, as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here to teach me? And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants or skirt to give you some remedial work. And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first, first and if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, but if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. My friend Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's written this wonderful book uh, called A New Earth, that's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this, he says, don't react against a bad situation, merge with that situation instead, and the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up, it means acting with responsibility. Okay, many of you know that, as President Hennessy said, I started this school in Africa. And I founded the school where I'm trying to give South African girls a shot at a future like yours, Stanford. And I spent five years making sure that school would be as beautiful as the students. I wanted every girl to feel her worth reflected in her surroundings. So I checked every blueprint, I picked every pillow, I was looking at the grout in between the bricks, I knew every thread count of the sheets, I chose every girl from the villages, from nine provinces, and yet, last fall, I was faced with a crisis I'd never anticipated. I was told that one of the dorm matrons was suspected of sexual abuse. Well, that was, as you can imagine, devastating news. First I cried, actually I sobbed, for about a half an hour, and then I said, let's get to it. That's all you get, is a half an hour. You need to focus on the now what you need to do now. So I contacted a child trauma specialist, I put together a team of investigators, I made sure the girls had counseling and support, and Gail and I got on a plane and flew to South Africa. And the whole time I kept asking that question, what is this here to teach me? And as difficult as that experience has been, I got a lot of lessons. I understand now the mistakes I made because I, had been paying attention to all of the wrong things. I built that school from the outside in when what really mattered was the inside out. So it's a lesson that applies to all of our lives as a whole. What matters most is what's inside. What matters most is the sense of integrity, of quality and beauty. I got that lesson. And what I know is is that the girls came away with something too. They've emerged from this more resilient and knowing that their voices have power. I did this at the end of my uh, sh uh, show. I did my favorite guest of all times. That's hard to do out of literally th thousands and thousands. They, they, they supposedly estimated lines. that there's like 35,000 people I interviewed over the years. But there was one woman out of all the celebrities, out of all of the famous, non-famous, infamous people. One woman who from was Zim she? Who was she? Her name is Terai Trent. Listen to this story. I'm gonna try to shorten it for you, Please Godfrey. Do. Okay. Terai Trent, born and raised in a village in Zimbabwe. 11 years old, she's doing her brother's homework. She wants to go to school. Her father says, no, you're a girl. You have to educate the boy first. Yep, that's right. That was the I, tradition. That's right. The boy has to go to school, you can't go to school. So she starts doing her brother's homework. She does his her brother's homework, he goes to school, he gets all A's on his homework, yet he doesn't know the answer to the question. The teacher comes to the village to say, what is going on here? This boy doesn't know the answers, but his homework's perfect. She finds out that Terai, his younger sister, 
is doing his homework. She begs the father to let Tarai go to school. The father says, no, she can't go to school. Finally, he marries her off. She marries at 11 and a half years old. She gets married. She has three children by the time she's 18 years old. A woman comes to the village from an NGO, Heifer International, and asks, what are your dreams? This is going to make me cry. Finally, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> asks it. her, what are your dreams? This child has never thought about what her dreams were. She says, write down your dreams. She writes down her dreams on a piece of paper and she folds them in a tin can and she buries them under a rock. The oh, first dream was to be able to go to, the school in, go to a school in the United States of America and get a college degree. She ends up, through some miracle of the NGO, going to the United States. She wow. gets a college degree. Wow. Yes, she gets a four-year degree in three years. Wow. Tara Wright Trent. She goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes her next goal on the piece of paper. She buries it under the rock. She writes, I want to get a master's degree. She goes back to the United States. She gets a master's degree. By this time, she now has five children. She's married to a man who still oh, beats incredible. her. Incredible. She goes back to the United States. She gets her master's degree. After the master's degree, she goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes down her final goal is to get a doctorate degree. And last year, she became Dr. Tarai Trent. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? Um, I found her in the, in the Nicholas Kristof's book called... Uh, something, the sky, underneath the sky, or the sky. I, Nicola, I found her in Nicholas Kristof's book. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And I was reading the story. I had Nicholas Kristof on the show. Nicholas Kristof, the famous New York Times writer. And she wasn't there. She wasn't a part of the show. I'm reading the story. I can't believe this book, the story of this woman, as I'm reading the story. So when we go to do the show, the producers have Nicholas Kristof on. They bring on other guests, but this woman isn't there. I go, how, how could you not have her there? So we tape another show with Nicholas Kristoff. We go back, I go, fine, we're gonna find that woman, Tara Wright Trent. This time, by this time, she's living in the United States. We followed her back to Zimbabwe, to the rock. We pulled the tin can from underneath the rock. And that is my favorite guest of all time. And the worst? Um, I don't have a worst. I don't have a worse. But the reason why she, and, and as I said this on my show, so the reason why Tara Wright Trent is my favorite guest of all time is because she represents in that one story of the little girl in a village in Zimbabwe who had a dream and the heart and depth and discipline to pursue it. She represents everything I tried to say in every show in 25 years. She literally, through her life story, sums up the message that I was trying to give to every single one of my viewers. You can. You can. Keep trying. Don't give up. You have to believe. You have to believe. Close your eyes for a moment, will you please? And breathe with me. Just close your eyes. And if you will, put your thumb to your middle finger and gather your other fingers around and let's feel the vibration and pulse of your personal energy as you take three deep breaths with me. Inhale. And as you exhale, just feel the vibration, energy, blood pulsating through your body through you. And another inhale. And another inhale. And keep your eyes closed. And let's just think about this day. This day that you have been graced to breathe in and out thousands of times. This day 
where many of those breaths were taken for granted. You just expected the next one to come. But the truth is there's no guarantee that the next one comes. This day, how you started your day, what your thoughts were this morning, how you've carried yourself through this day, how you've been allowed to have encounters and experiences, some challenging, some more life enhancing, that pushed you forward another day of being here on the planet Earth as a human being. Let's just think about that. After all you've been through, in this day alone, and the many days and years past, how you got here to this prestigious, esteemed university, the choices you made that have brought you to this day, Open your heart and quietly to yourself. Say the only prayer that's ever needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're still here and you get another chance this day to do better and be better. Another chance to become more of who you were created and what you were created to fulfill. Thank you. Everything you try to do is already done. So when I figured that out, oh, what I'm putting out is what's coming back. Let me get real clear about what it is I'm putting out. Real clear. So I read a book about 1989 called Seed of the Soul. And in that book, Gary Zukav talked about the laws of karma, of the laws of cause and effect, the third law of motion. And in that book, he talked about how intention, your intention is always one with the law. Meaning, before you even think about a thing, you have an intention for the thing. And that the intention is going to determine the outcome. That's why the same people can go to the same church service and somebody walk down the aisle just to be seen to put some money in the church and somebody else who just goes and just has a little bit to offer. The intention with which you give, the intention with which you serve determines the outcome. So when I figured that out, I went, whoa, I changed everything I did on my show. I called in the producers and I said, from this day forward, I will no longer be speaking to the KKK. I will no longer be speaking to people who are fighting each other in a way that it is damaging to the character of myself and other people who watch. From this day forward, I am only going to do intentional television. I know you all understand better than most that real progress requires authentic, an authentic way of being, honesty, and above all, empathy. I have to say that the single most important lesson I learned in 25 years, talking every single day to people, was that there's a common denominator in our human experience. Most of us, I tell you, we don't want to be divided. What we want, the common denominator that I found in every single interview, is we want to be validated. We want to be understood. I've done over 35,000 interviews in my career. 
And as soon as that camera shuts off, everyone always turns to me and inevitably in their own way asks this question, was that okay? <laughs> I heard it from President Bush. I heard it from President Obama. I've heard it from heroes and from housewives. I've heard it from victims and perpetrators of crimes. I even heard it from Beyonce and all of her Beyonce-ness. <laughs> she finishes performing, hands me the microphone and says, was that okay? <laughs> Friends and family, yours, enemies, strangers, in every argument, in every encounter, every exchange, I will tell you, they all want to know one thing. Was that okay? Did you hear me? Do you see me? Did what I say mean anything to you? And even though this is the college where Facebook was born, my hope is that you will try to go out and have more face-to-face -face conversations with people you may disagree with. That you'll have the, the, the courage to look them in the eye and hear their point of view and help make sure that the speed and distance and anonymity of our world doesn't cause us to lose our ability to stand in somebody else's shoes and recognize all that we share as a people. This is imperative for you as an individual and for our success as a nation. The way to make movies is to do stuff that you love because, you know, for 25 years I worked on The Oprah Show and uh, Stedman will tell you that there were day nights that I came home and I almost, you know, it was hard to even like take off my clothes because I knew I was going to be getting up four hours later. But I never really felt exhausted. Like, I never I felt exhausted, but I never felt depleted. So do the work that comes straight from the soul of you from your background, from stories that you've grown up with, from stories that bring you passion, from stories that you uh, not just yearn to tell, but that if you don't tell them, they won't get told. And when you, when you are operating, you know, the single, the single greatest uh, wisdom I think I've ever received, other than when people show you who they are, is that the key to fulfillment, success, happiness, contentment in life is when you align your personality with what your soul actually came to do. I believe everybody has a soul and has, you know, their own personal spiritual energy. So when you can use your personality to serve whatever that thing is, you can't help but be successful. So if you do films that come from the interior of your soul, you do work, you do art that comes from the interior of you, it, it, you cannot miss. It's only when you're doing stuff that you think might make money, you think it may be uh, a hit, or you think it may uh, bring you some level of attention or success. That isn't what does it. I would have to say that all of the great wonderful experiences of my life that have brought me to this moment have come from working from the interior of myself. And so that's why it feels so authentic because it, it actually is. So when you do that, you'll win. One of the things I started to get uh, around mid to late, no, no late, mid to late 90s, is that everybody that I had on the show at the end of the show would say something to me like, um, was that okay? Was that okay? How was that? Was that okay? Right. At the end of the interview. And I started to then track it. It didn't matter if it was, um, I, 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 I had gone and done a show where I was in um, a prison and I was interviewing a father who was in jail for life for murdering his twin daughters. And at the end of the interview, even behind bars, he said to me, is that okay? How'd I do? And Barack Obama said it when he sat in the chair the first time. And George Bush said it. Beyonce said it at the end of her. She taught me how to twerk and then said, is that okay? <laughs> so that's an acquired skill, do you think? Right? Yes, the twerking thing. But this is what I learned uh, sitting in that chair for 25 years. That at the end of the day, whether you are interviewing me or I get to interview you 
whatever your profession is, wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, the person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that mattered? I went through some tough times after, after I left the Oprah show. I made a conscious decision that I did not want to be sitting on TV with the Oprah show and y'all saying, she should have left that show. That show was really good two years ago. I made a conscious decision, decision that when I felt I had said all that I could say and the audience had heard it, that I would move on. And that I would not spend my life regretting or trying to hold on to what used to be or hold on to what I had. So I dreamed this dream of starting a network. And in the beginning, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because I didn't, I, honest to goodness, I did not know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out. I thought that the Oprah show audience would follow us to own, and then I realized y'all didn't have cable. And if you had cable, you did not have the own package. So, so it took me a minute. And unlike most people who you get to have your mistakes in private, something doesn't go right in your life, you get to sulk about it in private. If I make a mistake, it's on the CNN crawl or the CNN news. So when I was in the climb and there were so many wonderful owners, I see Churl Action Jackson here. There were so many wonderful owners, people who said, oh, we're going to stand with you. We're going to stand by you. Thank you, Roland Martin. There were so many people who said, listen, we believe that this can happen. So I dreamed the dream along with Tyler Perry, who was my friend who came to me and said, Tyler, Tyler said, I'm gonna help you out because Tyler can go home and write a script and direct it, produce it, and shoot it. And do it for less money than anybody in Hollywood. So we started with the foundation of have and have nots. If loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, Mama Hattie. And then I started to dream another dream about scripted television, because in the beginning I was told you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, didn't have enough money to do it. And I dreamed the dream. I read Proverbs 11:28 that says, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will rise and thrive like a green leaf. I first started making money and it was, you know, my salary or my earnings were published all over the place. I mean, the first year I was like, really? Did I make that much money? Oh my God. Um, it, it was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything. So it's easy when you don't have anything and people ask you for money. And they say, I need 500. And you say, I don't have it because I'm just trying to get my rent paid. It's harder when your multi-billion dollar salary is now in the paper and you get a lot of friends and cousins you didn't have before. So how do you set boundaries for yourself? I was having trouble setting boundaries myself for myself for even strangers. People would just show up at my door in Chicago and say, oh, bro, I left my husband, please help me. And I would because she knows I have it. So, don't try that now though, okay? <laughs> Don't try that now, I figured it out. So what I learned was is that, oh, the reason why people keep showing up is because my intention is to make them think that I'm such a nice person that 
you can ask me for anything, you can get me to do anything, I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna say yes. So when Stevie called me this time, I thought I'd try out my first no on Stevie. Let's start big. He wanted me to donate some money to a charity and I didn't wanna to donate to the charity because I have my own charities and I care about a lot of people, but the, the, the problem is when you, you have money, everybody thinks you just wanna to give to everything. So every letter I ever get starts with, we know you love the children. <laughs> yes, I do love the children, but somebody else is gonna to have to help the children. So I said to Stevie, uh, I said to Stevie, no. And um, as a person who has that disease to please, I was waiting for him then to, to say, I will never speak to you again. I will never call you. I will never sing a song for you. <laughs> and he didn't. He just said, okay. Okay? Okay, it's okay? He said, okay. Check you later. And... What I learned from that is, many times you will have angst and worry about things and put yourself in a state, like someone said this morning because their phone went off, they were mortified over a phone, I said, really? Um, you will put yourself in a state when the other person really isn't even thinking about you. So learning that I could specifically determine for myself what the boundaries were for me. What I wanted to do, give my money, give my time, give of my service to who I wanted to give it to when I did, that I get to make that decision. And just because you get 100 requests a week doesn't mean you have to try to fulfill all of that. Just because you have all of these demands on your time and on you doesn't mean that you have to say yes. You get to decide because you're the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, as William Ernest Henley said in Invictus. And understanding that really changed the meaning of my life in that I was not no longer driven by what other people wanted me to do, but took charge of my own destiny, making choices based upon what do I feel is the next right move for me. Everybody works hard and everybody has their own dreams. There is, there was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things, wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice, I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. You get to live in the space that you purposefully have come to earth to claim for yourself. So, around 1984, I was sitting in bed one morning uh, Sunday morning, should have been in church, but I wasn't. I was reading the New York Times review of The Color Purple. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like a really great book. I got out of bed in my pajamas, put on my galoshes, and went to the store to get the copy of The Color Purple. I read The Color Purple in one afternoon, got, went back to the bookstore, bought every book of The Color Purple. I took the books to, to the office and I said to everybody, y'all gotta read this book. Oh my God, you gotta read this book, Color Purple. I needed a book club, I didn't have one. Uh, so I pass out the book to everybody I knew. Please, read the Color Purple, read the Color Purple. Then I start to hear that somebody's gonna do a movie about the Color Purple. But I don't know anybody in the movie business. By this time, I was on AM Chicago. I don't know anybody. I start praying to God. God, please help me find a way to get into Color Purple. I say, Jesus, I don't even have to have a speaking part. I will be, because I went to the movies and I saw on the movie credits, at the last credit, there's something called Best Boy. So I said, Jesus, if you just let me be Best Girl, that'd be all right by me. I can be Best Girl. I can carry the script. I can help the people with the water. I can do whatever. So I start praying for the color purple. As, as divine law would have it, Quincy Jones comes to Chicago 
And he is in Chicago for one half of a day because somebody has filed a suit against Michael Jackson claiming that Billie Jean was their lover and that's not his song. <laughs> so Quincy had taken the red eye to Chicago. He was in his hotel room. He was coming out of the shower and the television in his hotel room is on AM Chicago. There sits little chubby me with my Jerry Curl <laughs> on AM Chicago. Quincy Jones tells Reuben Cannon, the casting agent, I think I found Sophia. So I get a call from Reuben Cannon who says, I'm calling about a movie. It's called Moon Song. Would you be interested to come and audition? And I say, I have not been praying for Moon Song. <laughs> no. I had not been playing for Moon Song. I've been praying for the color purple. He said, well, I think you should come and, and, and audition. So I go to audition. You know, movie people, they're making everything all secret. Steven Spielberg didn't want anybody to know he was doing color purple. So on the outside of the script, it says Moon Song. But I know all the words by heart. <laughs> so when I open the script, I know this is the color purple Jesus. This is the color purple. Yes. So I auditioned for the color purple. I can't even believe it. They don't just want me to be the water girl or the best girl. They are asking me, do I want a part in the movie? Oh, that, that, I'm thinking prayer, prayer works. Prayer works. But listen to this. Three months pass. Three months is a long time. I auditioned in February. March, April, May comes. I haven't heard anything. So I call Reuben Cannon. I say, Mr. Cannon, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't heard anything. I expected to hear something by now. And Reuben Cannon, African-American man, says to me, you don't call me. I call you. And I didn't call you. Do you understand that I have real actresses who have auditioned for this part? Real actresses. And he tells me who just left his office and I went, well, okay, I'm not getting that part. So I hang up the phone and I start crying. I can't believe that God has played this trick on me. I think, this is a trick. So I decide that this is because the fat has finally caught up with me. The fat has finally caught up with me and now I must get rid of the fat in two weeks. I am going to go to a fat farm and I'm going to lose 25 pounds. I'm gonna drink a lot of green juice. I'm gonna have some cleanses and colonics. So I, I, I also was trying to make peace with it. I said, God, I don't understand. I thought it was for me. You ever had that talk with God? I, I, I thought it was for me. I thought it was for me. God, you let me audition with somebody named Harpo. That's my name backwards. Jesus, that was a sign. Wasn't it a sign? And then three months pass, and then, then Reuben Cannon says, real actresses have just left his office. So I start to pray on the track. I'm out on the track at the fat farm, and I am running around at the track at the fat farm. It starts to rain. Y'all know how that is but I don't even care because I am praying to God to help me to let it go. Help me let it go because now I've become obsessed with it and it's now controlling my life. I start praying, running around the track. And I keep hearing this noise and I, 
I can't, there's nobody on the track but me, and I'm running around the track. And I look around, and it is my thighs rubbing together. It's my thighs. My thighs are rubbing together, causing this thunderous sound. There's nobody on the track. So then I really start to cry. Oh Lord, help me. Help me let it go. Help me let it go. Help me let it go, God. Help me let it go. And you ever did this prayer where you say, okay, Lord, okay, I'm gonna let it go. Then you get up and you go, well, I think I still got a little bit of it. I did, help me let it go, but I am not gonna be able to see the other actress in my part. I won't be able to see it. I won't be able to see Color Purple. Just can't never see it the rest of my life. I won't be able to see it. So then I started, I don't know where it came from. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my Blessed Savior, I surrender all. I sang and I cried. I sang and I cried and I prayed some more until I could reach the point where not only, not only will I be able to go to the movie, but I can bless the other actress. I can bless her. I can say, I bless you. I bless you, I bless you with this. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And I tell you in my greatest testimony, that the instant I laid that thing down. I'm telling you, when I laid it down, when I laid it down and it didn't have me anymore, it had no control over me anymore, I didn't feel anything about it anymore. When I let it go, when I intentionally surrendered it to the power that was greater than I could ever know. The instant that happened, a woman comes running out of the cafeteria screaming, Ofri? Is your name Ofri? For 10 years, nobody could pronounce my name. I said, yeah, she said, somebody's on the telephone for you. He said, his name's Spielberg. I get to the phone, he says, I hear you're at a fat farm. I said, no, sir. This is a health retreat. He says, I'd like to see you in my office in California tomorrow, this, is, this was in Wisconsin I was, I'd like to see you in my office, and if you lose a pound, you could lose this part. No problem do I have. I don't have no problem not losing a pound. So honey, I packed my bags and I stopped at the Dairy Queen. I got three scoops just in case I'd lost half a pound. And the next day, I was in Steven Spielberg's office and he said, you're hired, you're hired.
My television career began unexpectedly. Uh, as you heard this morning, I was in the Miss Fire Prevention Contest. That was when I was 16 years old in Nashville, Tennessee, and you had the requirement of having to have red hair in order to win up until the year that I entered. So they were doing the question and answer period because I knew I wasn't gonna win in the swimsuit competition. So during the question and answer period, the question came, why young lady, what would you like to be when you grow up? And by the time they got to me, all the good answers were gone. So I had seen Barbara Walters on the Today Show that morning. So I answered, I would like to be a journalist. I would like to tell other people's stories in a way that makes a difference in their lives and the world. And as those words were coming out of my mouth, I went, whoa, this is pretty good. I would like to be a journalist. I want to make a difference. Well, I was on television by the time I was 19 years old. And in 1986, I launched my own television show with a relentless determination to succeed. At first, I was nervous about the competition, and then I became my own competition, raising the bar every year, pushing, pushing, pushing myself as hard as I knew. Sound familiar to anybody here? Eventually, we did make it to the top, and we stayed there for 25 years. The Oprah Winfrey Show was number one in our time slot for 21 years. And I have to tell you, I became pretty comfortable with that level of success. If you want more Inspresso morning videos, they're not on this channel anymore. I have a dedicated channel just for it. It's right there next to me. Go click it there. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.